Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to cover the last part of chapter 11, and we're also going to cover chapter 12. And the last part of chapter 11 talks about synapses, which are the places where neurons are going to uh, come together and transfer information from one neuron to another. So there are pathways in which the information will be passed from one neuron to the next, uh, whether the, the information is sensory or motor. So um, if you look at two neurons that are connected in a pathway, um, one neuron is going to be um, the presynaptic neuron, which is going to be sending an action potential down its axon. So let's say, let me start from the beginning. The uh, stimulus will arrive, let's say, and affects this neuron right here, neuron number one. And we're going to call neuron number one the presynaptic neuron. And upon arrival of the stimulus, the stimulus creates a graded potential which will lead, if it's strong enough, to an action potential created at the axon hillock, and the action potential is spreads down until, I don't want that, okay, until it gets, oh dear, I don't know what happened, it gets to the end, and at the end of the axon, the action potential causes the release of a neurotransmitter. Okay, so now there's a neurotransmitter released into the space between the two neurons. The space is called the synapse. Um, and so the space will be the synaptic space. Synapse, okay, that's not what, right, synapse. The other neuron, we're going to neuron number two, will be the postsynaptic neuron. And it will have receptors for the neurotransmitter on its surface. The neurotransmitter binds to the receptors. And receptors are uh, uh, binding of the neurotransmitter to the receptor causes the opening of ion channels. So that now uh, the um, neuron number two, the postsynaptic neuron, experiences a graded potential, which may or may not lead to an action potential but let's say it does. So now the action potential travels down. And let me make a point by making a third neuron here. So now we're going to have a second synapse. OK. So now we have synapse number two. Now, if you look at synapse number two, in this case, neuron number two will be the presynaptic neuron. And neuron number three will be the postsynaptic neuron for this synapse number two. So a synapse consists of a, 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 a place where two neurons are going to meet, or more than two, at least two. Uh, one neuron will be the presynaptic neuron, the one that will release the neurotransmitter. The postsynaptic neuron will be the one that has the receptors for the neurotransmitter and will be affected by the neurotransmitter. So you should be able to recognize presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. So this is showing you a neuron that is being synapsed by several axons from other neurons. So we're going to have this presynaptic neuron here that is uh, creating an, a, a synapse at the body of the postsynaptic neuron. This is the postsynaptic neuron. So this will be an axosomatic synapse. Remember that neurons can receive a stimulus from uh, intosoma into their body or their dendrites. This other presynaptic neuron here, number two, is synapsing at the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron right here. So this is an axodendritic synapse. Okay. Um, so most synapses are going to come from the axon of the presynaptic neuron into the body or the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. So let's look at another synapse. Here again, these synapses are chemical synapses because the presynaptic neuron is going to release a neurotransmitter and the postsynaptic neuron is going to have the uh, receptor for the neurotransmitter. 
So this next PowerPoint looks at a close-up of the synapse. This neuron number one here is the presynaptic neuron, which means that the structure that we're looking at here would be the axon N. Okay, so we're looking at, let me go back here. We're looking at that area right there. Okay, so we have the presynaptic neuron. And you can see within the presynaptic neuron, you can see the little uh, vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter. So when the action potential travels down the axon of the presynaptic neuron, and arrives at the end of the presynaptic neuron. So this is the action potential arriving. The arrival of the action potential causes the membrane of the presynaptic neuron, the calcium channels of the presynaptic neuron to open and calcium ions, which are always found in tissue uh, uh, fluid, calcium is gonna enter this presynaptic neuron because the action potential opened calcium channels and calcium is going to cause the release of the neurotransmitter. Okay, so now we have the neurotransmitter released into the synaptic cleft. The postsynaptic neuron, neuron number four here, uh, this structure that we see, uh, the postsynaptic neuron is gonna be the dendrite and within the postsynaptic neuron, we're gonna have the receptors for the neurotransmitter. So the neurotransmitter is gonna to bind to the receptors and that's gonna cause the opening of ion channels and ions will either go into the cell or out of the cell depending on the kind of channel that is being opened. So that's the events that happened at a synapse. Uh, the next PowerPoint again depict the same. So we have the um, action potential arriving, traveling and arriving at the end of the presynaptic neuron. Uh, we have the upon arrival of the action potential, calcium channels open and calcium goes into the neuron. And the calcium is going to cause the release of the neurotransmitter. Okay, so now the neurotransmitter is in the synaptic cleft and the receptors for the neurotransmitter in the postsynaptic neuron are going to bind to the, to the neurotransmitter and that is going to cause the opening of, of ion channels. Now remember that the neurotransmitter has to be released, it has to travel down the synaptic cleft and then bind to the receptor nothing is happening while these events are taking place. So that's what we call the synaptic delay. Uh, until the channel, the ion channels are opened, no visible response will be seen by the postsynaptic neuron. So the, the, the time that it takes between the release of the neurotransmitter and a response by the postsynaptic neuron is what we call the synaptic delay. So again, ion channels will be open. And let's look close up of the ion channels. This is the ion channel bound by the neurotransmitter. And notice that now the, uh, the channel is open and some ions will go in, some ions will go out. And depending on the net movement of ions in or out and the type of ion being moved in or out, the response of the uh, postsynaptic neuron will be to create a, a action potential or not to create an action potential. Either way, the response will be called a graded potential. Now, whether a graded potential leads to an action potential or not, that depends on the kind of ion that is being brought into the cell or out of the cell. And we'll explain this a little bit later here in a minute. Okay, now, uh, before we move on, remember that the neurotransmitter is not gonna stay at the synapse for very long. It either will be degraded by enzymes, taken up again by the presynaptic cell, or simply diffused away. For example, acetylcholine was the neurotransmitter as released by the somatic motor neurons. It doesn't stay very long on the synapse because the enzyme acetylcholinesterase is going to degrade it very quickly. 
So the strength of the graded potential will be determined by the amount of neurotransmitter released, the time the neurotransmitter stays in the area, and the type of postsynaptic potential that will be created by the ion channel. So the third part is what we're going to talk about. Remember, the neurotransmitter will either be degraded by enzymes, taken up by the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron, or simply diffuse, uh, diffuse away. Again, the, the synaptic delay is what happens and between this of the neurotransmitter and the response by the postsynaptic uh, cell. Postsynaptic cell uh, will respond or not, depending on the amount of neurotransmitter, the time the neurotransmitter stays in the area, and the type of postsynaptic potential. So let's talk about these. What is a postsynaptic potential? Well, the postsynaptic potential or the response can be one of two kinds. It can be an excitatory response or an inhibitory response, meaning that the um, go ahead and make really the presynaptic neuron. This is the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, let's say that the neurotransmitter is released, and the receptor for the neurotransmitter is going to be a sodium channel. Okay, so that would be a chemically gated sodium channel. When the neurotransmitter binds to the sodium channel, the channel opens, and remember that there is more sodium outside the cell than inside the cell, so sodium will begin to flood the inside of the cell, bringing with it positive charges and depolarizing the cell. The depolarization could lead to an action potential if enough positive charges arrive at the axon hillock. So this will be an excitatory postsynaptic potential because it could create an action potential. Okay, so that's one scenario. Scenario number two. Let's say that the um, neurotransmitter secreted by the presynaptic neuron is going to bind to a receptor that is a potassium channel. So this is the potassium channel. When the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, the channel opens. And now remember that potassium is always inside the cell. So there's more potassium the king inside the cell than outside. So potassium will begin to leave the cell, creating, uh, making the cell more negative as it loses positive charges. And that's going to hyperpolarize the cell. And an action potential will not be created, essentially inhibiting the cell. Okay, so here is a depiction of an EPSP. Uh, the cell is at rest. The stimulus uh, arrives, and the stimulus is opens sodium channels. So the uh, neurotransmitter secreted binds to sodium uh, channels. Uh, sodium goes inside the cell, depolarizing the cell, and moving the cell towards the threshold value, minus 55 millivolts, which could create an action potential if arrives enough positive charges arrive at the axon hillock. So this is a EPSP or excitatory postsynaptic potential uh, because it's going to cause the depolarization of the cell, which may bring the neuron to threshold, creating an action potential. This happens when the neurotransmitter binds to, to receptors that are chemically gated ion channels that allow sodium into the cell. Uh, there we go, sodium into the cell. This is a depiction of the IPSP, uh, IPSP inhibitory postsynaptic potential. In this case, the stimulus uh, causes the release of a neurotransmitter that binds to the postsynaptic neuron and causes the opening of potassium channels. Potassium leaves the cell, making it more negative. So now the cell is moving, the, the voltage is moving away from threshold. 
So IPSP is a local hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic membrane that drives the neuron away from the action potential. This happens when potassium channels or chlorine channels are open. Potassium will leave the cell, making it more negative. Chlorine will go into the cell, and with its negative charge, will make it more negative. So, uh, the postsynaptic potential that could create an action potential and excite the cell will be an EPSP. An IPSP will inhibit the cell, the, the postsynaptic cell. Now, none of these can happen without summation, which means that one firing of neurotransmitter is not going to cause any change in the postsynaptic cell. We need summation of firings, whether it will be internal summation or a spatial summation. Okay, so the firing, the, the release of the neurotransmitter has to be continuous or affected by more than one neuron before the, the uh, effect can be added up and cause either an EPSP or an IPSP. So let me show you temporal summation. In temporal summation, you have the presynaptic neuron, and it fires one time, okay, it fires. It is uh, depolarizing the cell, but it is not depolarizing enough to create an action potential. And time passes, the effect dwindles, then it fires again, but again, it's not enough to create an action potential. But look at what happened if, if instead of letting a lot of time pass within, in between firings, what if the firings happen close together in time? Temporal summation. Now, one firing moves the uh, uh, membrane towards positive. The second firing moves it even more, crossing threshold, and now can create an action potential. Okay, so enough positive charges arrived by two consecutive close together firings that enough arrive at the axon hillock to initiate an action potential. That's called temporal summation. A spatial summation happens when we have two neurons, two presynaptic neurons firing at the same time, creating enough of a firing, enough, enough uh, opening of sodium channels to bring in enough positive charges to create an action potential at the action hillock. So that's called a spatial summation when two neurons fire at the same time, each one causing an EPSP, the EPSPs add up and an action potential is created. What it could also happen with the spatial summation is that one presynaptic neuron is excitatory, the other one is inhibitory. And in that case, nothing happens to the cell because one moves it towards EPSP, the other one moves it away from threshold, and nothing happens. So even though we talk about neurotransmitters and we name neurotransmitters, ultimately what dictates the effect of the neurotransmitter is going to be the receptor for the neurotransmitter, not the neurotransmitter itself, which means that we could have a neurotransmitter, for example, acetylcholine, that could be excitatory, to some neurons and inhibitory to others, because the key is not necessarily the neurotransmitter, but the receptor. So cell one can have a receptor that is a sodium ion channel, and that way the effect will be excitatory. Cell two can have a receptor that is a potassium channel. And in that case, the cell will hyperpolarize and it will be inhibited from producing an action potential. Okay. So, um, so it's important. The importance is in the in the receptor, not so much the neurotransmitter itself. Having said that, though, uh, there are many types types of neurotransmitters. Uh, some be excitatory or inhibitory depending on the receptor. Others are exclusively excitatory. So for example, acetylcholine, uh, this is a cholinergic neurotransmitter. It is the neurotransmitter uh, used by the somatic motor neuron. Uh, it is also the neurotransmitter released by some autonomic neurons. Remember, this can be excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitter. In the case of, some of the uh, somatic motor neuron, it is always excitatory, however. Uh, this is the neurotransmitter degraded by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. 
Another group of neurotransmitters are catecholamines. Dopamine is an example of a catecholamine neurotransmitter. Norepinephrine is another one. Epinephrine is actually not a neurotransmitter, it's a hormone. So I'm going to erase it from the list. Uh, indolamines is another group, serotonin and histamine, which are uh, neurotransmitters secreted by the brain. And so they will play a role in uh, behavior. I'm going to uh, yeah, the next PowerPoint talks about endorphins, which are a group of neurotransmitters that are act as opiate to reduce pain. Uh, nitric acid is another new neurotransmitter. Um, so you should uh, recognize examples of neurotransmitters. So again, the effect of the neurotransmitter could be excitatory or inhibitory. If it is excitatory, that means the cell, the postsynaptic cell receiving the neurotransmitter will be polarized. If it is inhibitory, that means the effect on the uh, postsynaptic cell will be hyperpolarization. Acetylcholine is always excitatory on a skeletal muscle, inhibitory on cardiac muscle. Again, the effect has to do with the receptor, not with the neurotransmitter itself. Now, neurotransmitters can uh, exert their action directly or indirectly. And we have been talking about the examples we've been given have been the direct action in which the receptor is the ion channel itself. And when the uh, neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, the ion channel opens and ions go in or out of the cell depending on the type of ion channel. So this is a direct action between re neurotransmitter, receptor, ion channel. Let me show you an indirect action. Okay, in this case, the receptor is not an ion channel, but it's just a protein that is sticks out of the, the uh, postsynaptic neuron cell. The neurotransmitter binds to the receptor. The binding activates a protein called a G protein, which moves and activates another protein called an adenylate cyclase, which in turn produces a substance called cyclic AMP, CAMP, from ATP. CAMP in turn activates, opens up a neurotransmitter, I'm sorry, an ion channel. Okay, so what's opening the ion channel is not directly the neurotransmitter, but a molecule called cyclic AMP, which was formed because the neurotransmitter bound to a receptor protein which activated G protein, which activated the enzyme that makes cyclic AMP. So this is an example of an indirect um, action of the neurotransmitter. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about, unless we have questions. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about for this chapter is going to be the pathways that neurons form as they lay information or commands from one neuron to another. So these are called, this is called neural integration. And uh, pathways can be divergent, meaning that uh, the information is going to be spread from the neuron that, let's say, received the stimulus to two neurons, which in turn, uh, is they're going to spread it to two neurons each, which in turn is spread it to two neurons each. So the information is being passed on to more and more and more neurons, creating what we call a diverging pathway. So this is the uh, uh, information is, um, there is a um, uh, increase in the number of neurons that are sending that information to the part of the brain. So the, the information is being amplified. Okay, uh, let me give you another, ex another of a divergent uh, circuit. And in this case, the information, instead of being amplified, is being sent to different places of the, of the nervous system. So I can give you an example of these. For example, the uh, stimulus that is traveling through these pathways could be visual information coming from the retina of the eye. So visual information initially comes from one source, which will be the retina of the eye, the cranial, the optic nerve. And as, it, as that optic nerve arrives at the brain, it begins to 
give that information to, to different parts of the brain. So parts of the brain that need visual information will be the visual cortex, which is going to create an image. Uh, it could also be the part of the brain that is in charge of visual reflexes. So the information is spreading to two different areas by di a divergent pathway. The opposite of that of a divergent pathway would be a convergent pathway. In a convergent pathway, we have multiple neurons, one, two, and three, acting upon one neuron. So let me give you an example of these. Let's say that this output one neuron is a somatic motor neuron, which is going to innervate the diaphragm, which is a breathing muscle. So normally, a neuron number three is the one that's stimulating the output neuron, and the other two pathways are minimal as to what how they stimulate. Neuron number three is the one that come, is coming from the automatic respiratory centers in the brain. So this will be coming from respiratory centers. And this is the pathway that is uh, taking precedent. Uh, what if we become emotionally upset? So now the emotional part of the brain is going to take over and is going to um, stimulate the neuron going to the diaphragm. And the stimulus from input number three is going to be diminished to enhance a stimulus from the emotional neuron. So now we begin to change our respiratory rate because we're emotional, we're upset. Okay. Uh, let's say the cerebral cortex, uh, voluntary part of the brain, wants to take over. And now we want to uh, voluntarily slow down, calm ourselves down, slow down our respiratory rate. Now the input from neuron number two will be enhanced, while the input from neurons number one and three are uh, diminished. So we have three different sources from three different parts of the brain that could affect the output neuron and therefore affect you know, the way we breathe. Here's an example of a converging pathway. The next pathway is a reverberating pathway, which is actually a very interesting pathway because what happens here, let me show you, is that um, we have a, um, a chain of neurons that uh, have these cultural branches that are going to uh, stimulate one neuron in the pathway and that final neuron of the pathway Comes, comes out and it has branches that stimulate the first neurons on the pathway, creating essentially a circuit. Okay. So what happens is in these cases that we have the stimulus coming in from the input neuron. And this is the key here because as long as this input neuron continues to, uh, to initiate the reverberating pathway, the reverberating pathway will continue on and feed on itself, if you will. Uh, let me give you an example of a reverberating pathway. Uh, consciousness or alertness is considered to be caused by a reverberating circuit in which um, the stimulus, let's say we're asleep, all of a sudden the alarm rings. So that is the stimulus, the initial st the stimulus that initiates the pathway. But once it's initiated, it's going to feed on itself and keep itself going in a circuit. So as long as this is happening, we're going to keep ourselves alert and awake. Okay. So that's an example of a reverberating pathway. Okay. Uh, let me skip now to another pattern of processing called a reflex. And a reflex is a rapid automatic response to stimulus. Um, the uh, yeah the uh, uh, pathways is going to call is going to be called a reflex arch, and a reflex arch has five components. It has a receptor that receives the stimulus. It has a sensory neuron that takes the information to the central nervous system, where an interneuron is going to receive the information and pass it on to a motor neuron, which is going to innervate an effector organ that can be a muscle or a gland. Okay. 
Now, these are the basics of a reflex arch. A reflex arch could be made even simpler because the receptor itself could be the sensory neuron. So the sensory neuron could act as a receptor. We can eliminate the integration neuron and the sensory neuron directly connects to the somatic, to the motor neuron. And now we only have one synapse. Uh, the motor neuron innervates the effector. So now we have sensory neuron, motor neuron, effector. Now we have only three components. In this case, we have a reflex that is extremely fast because there is no delay. There's only one synapse. Each synapse represents a delay. So in this case, we have made this a very fast reflex because there's only one delay, one synapse. So we'll come back to uh, reflexes on chapter 12. You should know the um, components of a reflex arch. Okay, so that's the end of uh, chapter 11. If there are no questions, I'm going to move on to chapter 12. Okay, so let me move on to chapter 12. And the PowerPoints for chapter 12 are going to be very similar to the PowerPoints for uh, the uh, the lab portion for ch uh, for the spinal uh, for the um, uh, spinal cord. Okay, so first of all, the functions of the spinal cord is a two-way communication to and from the brain. So we're going to have sensory information going up to the brain. Those will be ascending pathways. We're going to have motor commands coming down from the brain going to whichever muscle they have to go to or gland. Those will be descending pathways. So that's what they say two-way communication. The spinal cord is also a site of a spinal reflexes. So there is integration going on in the spinal cord. Uh, the spinal cord begins at the medulla oblongata. The spinal cord travels out of the brain of the uh, cranium of the skull to the foramen magnum and then travels inside each of the vertebra uh, through the uh, vertebral foramen. The spinal cord ends at a tapered end at around vertebra L2 at a uh, a uh, place called the conus medullaris. So let me give you another PowerPoint of these. This is the spinal cord, and you can see how it tapers at the conus medullaris. That's where it ends, and that's about at vertebra L2. It proceeds from vertebra L2, the spinal cord is, instead of a solid spinal cord, is just uh, individual nerves, and we call that the cow equina, right there, or the horse's tail. Notice that the spinal cord is being divided into areas, the cervical area, the thoracic area, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal area. The spinal cord ends at the beginning of the lumbar area at the level of uh, vertebra L2, lumbar vertebra number two, and the place where it ends is called the canus medullaris. Uh, from the um, from in between each vertebra, there are nerves that come out. These are called cervical. I'm sorry, uh, spinal nerves. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves at the cauda The uh, spinal cord ends, and what proceeds will be the spinal nerves from the uh, from the cauda Spinal cord ends at the canus medullaris. Uh, there are two places where the spinal cord enlarges, uh, the cervical enlargement and the lumbosacral enlargement. The cervical enlargement is an enlargement happening in the cervical area, and that's the place where nerves come in and out of from the upper limbs. So we have extra nerves coming at that point, the nerves from the upper limbs, which create the enlargement. Similarly, in the lumbosacral region, the spinal cord again enlarges right here towards the end before the uh, conus medullaris, it enlarges because it's receiving nerves from the lower limbs. So you should know the two places where there are enlargements of the spinal cord. Okay, as you can imagine, the spinal cord is a very uh, delicate area, so it has to have protections. Protections are coming from the vertebra itself, uh, they're coming from uh, layers of connective tissue called meninges, 
that surround the spinal cord and are also coming from uh, the fluid that surrounds the spinal cord on the outside and even on the inside. The fluid is called cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. So you can see in this model we have, let's see if I can make this bigger. No, I can't. Okay, I thought I could do that. All right, never mind. Okay, so this is a model from our lab of the spinal cord. You can see the spinal cord right here in the center. It is housed inside the uh, vertebral foramen. This is the vertebra right here. Okay. This is the body of the vertebra. This is the uh, spinous process of the vertebra. This is a cervical vertebra because it has the uh, bifid, the sport spinous process. Notice that surrounding the vertebra, we have this layer of tissue right there that surrounds the vertebra. So that's part of the meninges right there. And let's talk about the meninges. There are three layers of meninges. The outermost layer, which one you can see here, is called the dura mater or fecal sac. It has two names. Notice that the dura mater continues on out of the, of the uh, spinal cord and begins to cover nerves. At that point, we change its name to epineurium. The dura mater, um, right here, is found uh, below a space called the epidural space. So we have the bone right here. We have the, um, uh, gosh, uh, periosteum right there. So between periosteum and dura mater, there is a space filled with with um, fat tissue and blood vessels. So this space right here, this space is called the epidural space. Okay, and this is important because we're not gonna see this organization in the meninges of the brain. Uh, the meninges of the brain, the dura mater will be uh, adjacent to the bone. Here is not, there's a space between bone and dura mater. Space is called the epidural space. Again, this is showing you the dura mater over here and how it ends at around vertebra S2. Um, I found this picture on the internet. It's, very it's a very nice simplification of the spinal cord here and the meninges. So we're talking about the dura mater being this pink layer right here. Notice that this is the bone, the vertebra, and between the bone and the dura, there's a space called the epidural space. An epidural injection is an injection of anesthetic that is uh, delivered into the epidural space. From the epidural space, the anesthetic is going to seep into the back part of the spinal cord. It's going to numb the area that is being from which the epidural is being injected. So you should know what is an epidural injection. Where is the epidural injection delivered? It's delivered into the epidural space above the dura mater of the spinal cord. Next layer below the spinal cord is called the arach. I'm sorry, below the dura mater, it's called the arachnoid mater. The arachnoid mater is adjacent dura mater. So this is right here in purple is the dura mater. And then notice that there is another layer adjacent, which is going to be the arachnoid mater. So in the spinal cord, dura mater and arachnoid mater are adjacent to each other. Below the arachnoid mater, there's a space that you can see here. The space is called the subarachnoid space. And this is one of the places that is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So the spinal cord is completely cushioned, surrounded by these by this uh, CSF and cushioning uh, the, uh, C the, uh, the spinal cord. So again, the same simple depiction. You can see here the pitoral space, dura mater, adjacent dura mater is the arachnoid mater. Arachnoid mater has projections of fibers into the space below, which is called the subarachnoid space. And those projections from the arachnoid mater is what gives the 
uh, arachnoid mater its name because it looks like a spider webs projecting down from the arachnoid mater into the uh, subarachnoid space. Again, remember that the subarachnoid space is one of the places where we find CSF in the spinal cord. And then finally, the uh, deepest meninges is the PM mater, which is uh, virtually touching the spinal cord, as you see here. Uh, the PM mater uh, all extends into ligaments called denticulate ligaments that are going to anchor the spinal cord to the bone to prevent side to side movement of the spinal cord. The PM mater uh, continues on, it touches the spinal cord. After the conus medullaris, the PM mater continues on as a ligament called the phylum terminale, and the phylum terminale attaches the spinal uh, cord to the uh, coccyx. So this is, again, that's the conus medullaris here. This is the cauda equina. And you can see the little phylum terminale going down, all the way down, attaching to the coccyx. So the phylum terminale is going to um, is going to anchor the spinal cord lengthwise. Okay. Now, just a precaution: uh, students tend to confuse conus medullaris with phylum terminale. The conus medullaris is the end of the spinal cord. Phylum terminale, even though it has the word terminale in there, is the is not the end of the spinal cord. It's instead this ligament that comes out of the piamator and anchors the spinal cord to the coccygeal vertebra. So do not confuse conus medullaris and phylum terminale. Again, that's just another depiction, and it's showing you the denticular ligaments coming from the piamator and attaching to the duramator, anchoring the spinal cord. Now, this is another procedure called a lumbar puncture. A lumbar puncture takes a needle and injects it all the way into the subarachnoid space to retreat CSF for um, analysis. So make sure that you can distinguish between a lumbar puncture and an epidural injection. OK, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the, the cross-sectional view of the spinal cord and look at the uh, structures that we find on a cross-section of the spinal cord. Keep in mind that you will need to be able to do this in the test, to be able to label the structures on a cross-section of the spinal cord. From the spinal space of exactly, yes. The lumbar puncture, it goes into the subarachnoid space. So let me go back to the part. Let me go here. A lumbar puncture is going to go all the way down into right here, into the subarachnoid space and retrieve cerebrospinal fluid for analysis. So a lumbar puncture is a lot more dangerous because it's literally puncturing the dura mater and the mater going into the subarachnoid space. If the clinician goes too far, it can go past the pia mater and into the spinal cord and puncture the spinal cord. So that's part of the danger of a, of a lumbar puncture. Uh, epidural is still uh, dangerous because you could potentially go into the uh, dura mater and all the way into the spinal cord, but it's less likely because all we're doing is just going from into the epidural space to deliver an anesthetic. So make sure you can distinguish between those two procedures. Excellent. Good deal. Okay, so um, let's see. So we're going up for the structures that we can see in a cross section of this cord. And you can see here um, that uh, the spinal cord has a, uh, uh, these, uh, what, these uh, divisions right here and right here. Uh, we have a posterior division and an anterior division. Okay, so let's go from the beginning. First of all, when you look at a picture of the spinal cord, a cross section, your first question will be, what is posterior, what is anterior? Well, the best way to look at these is by looking at the gray matter of the spinal cord, which has a butterfly shape. The tips of the, of the uh, wings of the butterfly are in the posterior aspect. 
of the spinal cord, which means that this rounded part right here would be the anterior aspect of the spinal cord, okay? So just look at the tip of the wings of the butterfly, and that will tell you which side is posterior. So that tells us that this side is posterior, therefore this division here is what we call the posterior medial sulcus. Okay. Uh, the anterior division is called the anterior medial fissure. So don't confuse sulcus with fissures. Fissures are anterior, so the sulcus is posterior. If you have a hard time memorizing this piece, uh, put everything in alphabetical order. So A, F, P, S. Okay. And that will give you an A with F for fissure, P with S for sulcus. Okay. And then you'll know which one is posterior, which one is anterior. Hopefully that helps. Um, now let's look at the gray matter of the spinal cord. And notice that the butterfly obviously has two wings. So the part that connects the right and the left side, the uh, gray area, is going to be called the gray commissure. In the middle of the gray commissure, there's a little canal called the central canal. What circulates inside the canal is CSF. So now there are two places where CSF is found. CSF is found in the arachnoid, so I'm sorry, in the subarachnoid space. And CSF is also found in the central canal, circulating inside the central canal. So you should know the places in the spinal cord where CSF is found. Now, when you look at the uh, white matter surrounding the gray matter of the uh, spinal cord, you'll notice that the uh, white matter is, is found on each direction of the spinal cord. We call the white matter columns, white columns or funiculi. So we have the dorsal white columns or funiculi. We have the lateral white columns or funiculi, and we have the anterior white column or funiculi. So you know this will be right, this will be left, so this will be the right lateral uh, white column or funiculi, this will be the left lateral white column or funiculi. Um, the um, white matter of the, of the spinal cord is further divided into tracts or fasciculi, and these, the nervous system is highly organized, so the tracts, um, all of the, of the fibers traveling in the track, within a track, carry similar type of information. Um, so that brings us to this PowerPoint right, what is it, right here, right here. Oh, never mind, this is giving, you, uh, giving us the uh, gray matter. Let me go back here. Okay, so what we're talking about is, one more, sorry. Oops, too many. Okay, so what we're talking about is that the, um, the tracks found, for example, on the uh, dorsal or posterior white columns will carry, all of them will carry the same kind of information. Okay, this will be uh, tracks going up. The nerve fibers traveling through the, through the uh, tracks found in the lateral uh, white columns are all going to carry the same type of information. It could be, for example, sensor information coming from uh, or, or carrying uh, about pain, for example. All the information about pain is going to be traveling through the same area uh, of the of white matter on the spinal cord. Okay, so these are all highly organized. Now, when it comes to the gray matter, we call them gray horns. And again, we have the posterior gray horns, lateral gray horns, and anterior gray horns. Um, the function of these gray horns is, again, highly organized. The posterior gray horns have the uh, receive information from uh, interneurons, receiving information from somatic and visceral, uh, sensory information. So sensory information arrives at the posterior aspect of the spinal cord and the information is received by neurons at the posterior gray horn. 
neurons on the lateral gray hole are motor and these neurons are visceral motor which means that their fibers are going to come out from the anterior aspect of the spinal cord and they're going to go towards organs. Neurons located in the anterior gray horn are somatic motor, meaning that the fibers are going to come out and innervate skeletal muscle. So the anterior gray horn has the bodies of somatic motor neurons. The lateral gray horn ha houses the body of visceral motor neurons. The posterior gray horn uh, are, are receiving uh, information from somatic sensory and visceral sensory neurons. So the bodies of the neurons receiving the information will be in the posterior gray horns. So again, lateral gray horns are found in the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord. Uh, these, are go, these are somatic, uh, sorry, visceral motor neurons whose fibers are going to innervate glands and uh, uh, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. So this is part of the autonomic sympathetic nervous system, actually. Anterior gray horns, we're going to have the bodies of somatic motorons going to skeletal muscle. So this is showing you again the same information. OK, so uh, we have gone over the structures in the spinal cord. And now we're going to go outside the spinal cord to the fibers that go in and out of the spinal cord, which we're going to call roots. So on the posterior aspect, the roots are sensory. On the anterior aspect of the spinal cord, the roots are motor. So let me show you a, a, a drawing of these. OK, so this comes sensory information coming in. Sensory information travels in a unipolar neuron. So you can see the body of the little unipolar neuron in that area. And then the information enters into the posterior gray horns. The bodies of sensory neurons are all housed together in a ganglia close to the spinal cord called the sensory, the dorsal root ganglia. Okay. Um, here you have, this is the dorsal root ganglia, ganglia right there, and that's going to house the body of these unipolar sensory neurons as their axons go in to the posterior, through the posterior or dorsal roots into the spinal cord. The um, gray horns, the lateral gray horns, are going to house the bodies of motor visceral neurons, which are going to go out through the ventral roots or anterior roots. These are motor roots. And are going to take command to uh, skeletal, I'm sorry, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands. The anterior gray horn has the bodies of somatic motor neurons. Fibers are going to go out forming through the ventral root of the spinal cord, taking the commands to skeletal muscle. So the roots on the anterior aspect are called anterior or ventral roots, and they are motor roots. Motor information travels through those roots. The posterior roots are called dorsal or sensory roots. And um, sense information arrives through those roots. So, uh, dorsal roots are sensory. So, dorsal arterial S, S, sensory. Anterior roots or ventral are motor. Okay, so here you have the sensory roots coming in. That's the dorsal root ganglia. These are the anterior or roots or ventral roots. Notice that both fibers at one point travel in the same uh, within the same nerve. This is the spinal nerve right there. So spinal nerve is a mixed nerve because it has sensory and motor neurons uh, 
fibers traveling through the nerve. Okay, we're going to go back to talking about arches. We're going to pick up uh, reflexes again. So just to uh, remind you, a reflex arch is an automatic response to a stimulus. So the stimulus coming in via a unipolar neuron gives information to an interneuron, which in turn gives information to a motor neuron that leaves and goes off wherever it needs to go. So the basic components of a reflex arch are going to be the sensory receptor, the uh, sensory fiber, the interneuron, which is the CNS. Interneuron connects with a motor neuron. Motor neuron leaves the spinal cord and inner knee factor. Out of those components, the interneuron could be eliminated and then we'll have a much faster reflex arch because the sensory neuron innervates with the motor neuron directly. So let's look at an example of a reflex arch. Uh, here we have, uh, let's see, okay. Sensory receptors coming from the skin, and in this case, the receptor and the sensory neuron are the same thing. So we have just one component here, unipolar motor neuron, uh, gives information to an interneuron, which in turn relays information to a motor neuron that is going to go out and innervate a skeletal muscle. This type of synapse of a, a reflex arch is going to have one and two synapses. So again, a reflex is an automatic response to a stimulus. Uh, some reflexes are monosynaptic, meaning they have one synapse. In this case, the sensory fiber and the motor fiber are directly connected. So there is, we've eliminated the interneuron. Um, most reflexes are polysynaptic, meaning there are going to be interneurons creating more than one synapse. So let's look at a specific example of a reflex. This is called a, uh, a stretch reflex. And the stretch reflex is what happens in the leg when uh, somebody hits the knee and the leg goes up. Okay, that's a, that's a stretch reflex. Let me show you here what's happening. So in this case, the muscle that is going to contract and lift the leg is going to be the quadriceps muscle, all muscles in, have internally a uh, group of specialized fibers called the spindle fibers that are completely wrapped around by uh, sensory neurons. So these sensory neurons are detecting the level of a stretch or contraction of the muscle and relaying that information to the spinal cord. Okay, so when the uh, patellar ligament is hit with a hammer, as happens sometimes in the, you know, when you go to the doctor, that is going to pull on the tendon of the quadriceps and the little spindle sensors are going to sense the stretch of the muscle. The information is sent immediately to the central system, to the spinal cord, given to an inter to and directly, notice that here the green sensory neuron directly connects to the motor neuron, this is a one synapse, monosynaptic reflex. The motor neuron is going to go on and innervate the uh, muscle and um, uh, order it to contract. The muscle contracts, the leg lifts. This is a very simple monosynaptic reflex right here. Um, let's look at a more complex reflex. This is a cross extensor reflex. Let me show you here what happens. So in this case, what's happening is that you're walking and all of a sudden one foot steps on a tack. What needs to happen next is that the foot that is being harmed is going to bend while the other foot, foot the other leg is going to extend to catch balance so that you don't fall. So here's the sensory stimulus coming in. And now we have a complex polysynaptic reflex because we have at least two interneurons involved. The information is given to neuron, uh, interneuron number one here, which in turn gives it to the motor neuron that is going to innervate the muscles on the back of the 
leg, the hamstring muscles of the leg that is being harmed. Hamstring muscles uh, contract and the leg is flexed at the knee. At the same time, the sensory neuron gives information to another interneuron which crosses over to the other side the, and gives the uh, stimulate a motor neuron that is going to go and stimulate the quadriceps, the uh, quadriceps muscle of the other leg, of the opposite leg, which is going to extend and catch the balance of the leg. We have uh, flexors being uh, innervated from one leg and extensors from the other leg. Okay. So this will be a cross-extensor reflex, polysynaptic, very complex type of reflex. So you should know the difference between a monosynaptic and a polysynaptic reflex. Um, you should know that the simplest of reflexes eliminates the interneuron to have only one synapse between sensory and motor neurons. You should know what we mean by the withdrawal reflex and the cross-extensor withdrawal reflex. I'm sorry, the stretch reflex, which is monosynaptic, and the cross extensor withdrawal reflex. Okay, any questions? All right, next thing is we're going to look at the organization of nerves. Again, we have come out of the spinal cord, we're looking into the PNS, peripheral nervous system, we're looking at nerves of the, in the peripheral nervous system. So the organization of nerves is actually very similar to the organization of muscle, skeletal muscle. Uh, let me go over here first. The withdrawal reflex is not, is monosynaptic. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, it is. It's polysynaptic. The withdrawal reflex, give me just a second. Uh, yeah, the withdrawal reflex is uh, monosynaptic. Uh, sorry, polysynaptic. There we go. Oh, that's the, that's the uh, this this is the knee jerk reflex that we call this is the mono, this is the, the withdrawal reflex there we go yeah this is the withdrawal reflex one leg is withdraw the other one is is extend a withdrawal reflex is also what happens when you touch something hard and you withdraw immediately that's again a polysynaptic reflex the only example we have of a monosynaptic reflex is the stretch reflex okay so going back to uh, organization of nerves. Uh, okay, so this is a nerve. The nerve is covered by a connective tissue membrane called the epineurium. And the epineurium uh, bundles, uh, fascicles, which are bundles of nerve fibers bundled by a connective tissue called the perineurium. So this is a fascicle that has been pulled out. Uh, a fascicle is made by a whole bunch of nerve nerves uh, brought together uh, by the perineurium. And now we have one single nerve, many single nerves here, which we can see in this PowerPoint here. A single fiber is essentially the axon of a neuron. And you can see individual axon is covered by a connective tissue, should be completely covered by a connective tissue membrane called the endoneurium. So see, endoneurium is the connective tissue membrane that covers individual axons. Um, perineurium is the connective tissue that bundles several axons together. Epineurium is covering the outside of the entire nerve, which encompasses many fascicles. So you should be able to describe uh, or recognize descriptions of perineurium, epineurium, and endoneurium. Uh, one thing really quick, remember that the epineurium arises from the dura mater. So here's a dura mater that continues on and begins to cover the entire nerve. That's the epineurium, which changes its name once it's in the PNS from dura mater to epineurium. Okay, another important concept is that of dermatomes. Uh, dermatomes are areas of the skin which are supplied by uh, pairs of a spinal nerve. The only nerve that doesn't have a dermatome is C1, the very first of the spinal nerves. So what scientists have done is they have mapped out all these spinal nerves uh, and the areas of the skin served by the spinal nerve. 
So you can see, for example, here that the shoulders are being served by C4. Um, these uh, posterior aspect of the arm is, are innervated by C3. This leg right here, this uh, medial portion of the neck is innervated by L4. So why is this important? Well, if we lose sensation in, let's say, this part of the skin, now we can trace it back and say maybe there's a damage in the uh, spinal nerve L4. So we can, it allows us to try to pinpoint nerve damage by pinpointing the parts of the skin that are losing sensation, for example. Okay, and it works pretty well. The regions are, they do overlap a little bit, but um, clinically seen, it does help to identify the, ner the nerve that is damaged by uh, looking at which dermatome is losing sensation. So you should know what we mean by dermatomes. Now, spinal nerves themselves, there's 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and they have been uh, named according to the, uh, to, to the vertebra in between the uh, spinal nerves. So let me explain what I mean by that. Um, let me see something. Okay, so I'm going to make a little spinal column here on this. So this is going to be vertebra C1. It will be C2. This one will be C3. Remember, there are seven cervical vertebra. So this is C4, C5, C6, C7. And then after the cervical vertebra come the thoracic vertebra. So this will be T1, T2, and T3. We're going to stop here. There's 12 of them. I don't want to draw all of them. I don't need to draw all of them. Okay, so let me make this skull. This is the skull right here. Okay, so spinal nerve C1, the very first one, is coming from or in between a skull and cervical vertebra C1. So this is, oh no, bad, bad. Okay, let me go back here. So, on. I'm sorry about that. You know what? I'm going to make it right here. There's more room here. Okay, so let me make the little vertebra again. C1 and a skull right here. This is C2, C3. C4, C5, C6, C7. I'm going to change colors for T's. And I'm just going to make three T's. T1, T2, T3. Okay. So now I'm going to make the spinal nerves in black. The very first one comes out from between the skull and C1. And that's called spinal nerve. C1. That's the only one that doesn't have dermatome. Uh, then comes spinal nerve C2 from in between cervical vertebra C1 and C2. Here's C3. Here's C4. Here's C5. C6. C7. Now here's the next one, which is kind of weird because what they did with the next one is they called it C8. There is no such thing as cervical vertebra C8, but that's what they named the spinal nerve. Next nerve from that point on, next one is going to be called T1, T2, and it's going to go on until T12, and then we'll have L1 through L5, and um, then S1 through L4, etc. So this is the deal. Uh, the uh, spinal nerves. C1 through C7 are named after the vertebra that is below the nerve, um, whereas a spinal nerves, starting at a spinal nerve T1, the nerves are going to be named after the vertebra on top, with C8 being a weird nerve because it's between C7 and T1. So if I ask you, what nerve is exiting between C3 and C4, 
then you'll know that's going to be C4 because all the C's are named after the vertebra below. On the other hand, if I ask you which nerve is exiting between T5 and T6, then you'll know that it is T5 because it's starting with T1, nerves are named after the vertebra on top. <clears throat> so you should know the location of the spinal nerves in regard to the vertebra. Any questions about that? Okay. Next thing is, uh, actually we've already seen these, kind of, okay, yeah. Um, this is going for, um, okay, we're looking at the roots, we're looking at the uh, somatic sensory information arriving at the posterior gray horn, visceral motor coming out of the lateral gray horn, somatic motor coming out of the anterior gray horn. Uh, these are going to be the roots, the fibers that are coming in and out. In this case, the fibers are coming in because this is sensory. This is the dorsal root ganglia. These fibers are coming out because they are motor. Uh, and then the fibers travel together as they travel through the spinal nerve right there. Okay. Now, what happens after the spinal nerve, however, is that uh, more branches are going to appear. And the spinal nerve branches, ramus means branch, into a dorsal ramus, which is going to serve the uh, posterior aspect of the trunk. So sense information coming from the back is going to travel through the dorsal ramus, spinal uh, nerve, and then arrive, enter the spinal cord from the back. Okay, because all sensory information arrives at the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. Uh, motor commands going through muscles of the back are going to leave through the anterior root, travel through the spinal nerve, and then they're going to travel into the dorsal ramus towards muscles of the back, let's say the trapezius muscle, for example. Okay. Um, ventral ramus is the branch that is going to serve the limbs, upper and lower limbs, and the anterior and lateral aspects of the trunk. Okay, and this again is going to be sensory and motor. So sensory information coming from the skin around the belly button, for example, will travel through the ventral ramus, the spinal nerve enters through the dorsal root into the uh, posterior gray horns of the spinal cord. Motor commands going to, let's say, the uh, rectus abdominis. Okay, the muscle at the front, the abdominal muscle, leaves the anterior gray horn through the anterior roots, travel through the spinal nerve, through the ventral ramus towards its destination in the uh, anterior axis of the So that's or two rami, dorsal ramus, ventral ramus. There's a third ramus, which is actually two of them. It's called the rami communicans, which are these two right here. And the dynamic community is exclusively autonomic, meaning that the only thing that travels through these rami is going to be motor neurons, and these are going to be visceral motor neurons going to organs. In the thoracic uh, abdominal pelvic cavities. Okay. And notice that this route also has a ganglia. The ganglia is called the sympathetic ganglia. So motor neurons will synapse at the ganglia. So you should be able to identify these, uh, these branches of the spinal cord or ramuses that come from the spinal nerve. Okay, the dorsal root, the dorsal ramus, ventral ramus, the rami communicans with a sympathetic chain, a sympathetic ganglia. Uh, this is from a model in our lab. Uh, here's the spinal nerve, this is the dorsal ramus, this is the ventral ramus, and this is the rami communicans. One of the branches has been cut. This is the sympathetic ganglia. Okay, so really what we did is we looked at how the body's wired in and out of the spinal cord. So we're just looking at wires and where these wires run. Last thing we're going to do is we're going to look at spinal nerves. Okay, so as you can see, um, spinal nerves, 
come out of the spinal cord and they begin to branch. Those branches, those uh, intricate complex branches are called plexuses. And we're going to find uh, four plexuses, actually five plexuses along the spinal cord. There's going to be a plexus in the neck area that's going to be called the cervical plexus. There's going to be a plexus in the brachial in the, uh, around the arm area, so it's going to be called the brachial plexus. A plexus in the lumbar area, in the sacral area, and the coccygeal plexus. Notice that there are no plexuses in the thoracic area, so these complex networks are not found in between the ribs in the thoracic area. Um, we're going to highlight the important nerves of each plexus. So in the case of the cervical plexus, the important, important nerve is the phrenic nerve. And it is important because this is the nerve that enervates the diaphragm, which is the breathing muscle. So you can see the, the uh, phrenic nerve coming out of the cervical plexus, enervate the diaphragm. Among the brachial plexus, we have the axillary nerve, which enervates muscles of the shoulder. And so the axillary nerve comes out of the brachial plexus. The um, radial nerve also comes out of the brachial plexus. And it's going to innervate uh, right here. It's going to travel along the radius of the radial bone. And it's going to innervate flexors like the radialis muscle, for example. Muscular cutaneous nerve also comes out of the brachial plexus. And it's going to innervate in the arm the biceps and the brachioradialis muscle of the arms. The ulnar nerve and the median nerve are also brachial plexus nerves. The ulnar nerve are going to, is going to travel alongside with the ulna and it's going to innervate uh, flexors, uh, like the flexor carpi ulnaris. The median nerve travels right there in the middle between radial and ulnar and innervate uh, muscles like the pronator teres and the flexor carpi radialis. So again, the nerves of the brain plexus are axillary, muscular cutaneous, radial, medial, and ulnar. So five. From the lumbar plexus, we have uh, three nerves. We have the obturator, which comes out and it's going to innervate the adductors of the medial aspect of the thigh. The femoral nerve, which is going to eliminate, uh, innervate the muscles on the anterior aspect of the thigh, like the sartorius or the quadriceps muscles. And then coming from the femoral is a long nerve going along the median aspect of the medial aspect of the leg called the saphenous uh, nerve. So from the lumbar plexus, we have obturator, femoral, and coming from the femoral, the saphenous. Then finally, from the sacral plexus comes out the largest nerve in the body, which is the sciatic nerve. It travels, pos it travels posteriorly, as you can see here, at the back of the, of the thigh. And at the level of the knee, it's going to split into common tibial, sorry, into tibial and common fibular. So you can see how this is the sciatic nerve, and now it splits into the common fibular, which is going to go to the front, and the tibial, which will uh, innervate the uh, leg muscles, the posterior leg muscles, all the way to the foot. These are the fibulars coming around to the front and innervating muscles of the front of the leg. We have two of them, deep fibular and superficial fibular. So coming from the uh, sacral plexus, we have the sciatic. From the sciatic, the common fibular and the tibial nerves are going to branch. So you should know the plexus and the important nerves from each plexus that we mentioned. And that is the end of, um, of, uh, yeah, of uh, part number 12. Any questions? OK. All right, if there are no questions, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. And uh, I will uh, post the recording.